क्या क्या अच्छा अच्छा हाँ हाँ बहुत ही भारी है वो यार तो आपको वापस करेगा फिर ये वापस हाँ वो बहुत ही भारी आदमी हूँ वो वो हमेशा उसको प्रॉब्लम ही है वो नहीं मानता वो उसका ऐसा है आप उसको कभी से भी शुरू करो वो पहले वहां से बोलेगा फिर उसका है ना वो वो कैसे तो पीछे से शुरू हो जाएगा रिवाइंड होगा पहले दिन से आज तक वो Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Uh, we are uh, so. This is a uh, lecture five of a lecture series that MUHS Gene Health conducts regularly, and. Uh, uh, so we will keep sending information about the next ones also, and I would request now um, Dr. Sain sir to introduce the speaker. But before that, I just want to give some instructions. Please stay on mute um, during the talk. Uh, if you have any questions, you can please write in the chat box. And at the end of the lecture, I'm sure uh, Ranganathan sir would be happy to answer all the questions. Uh, uh, and, and now I just uh, request Dr. Sain sir, our HOD of GIBN department, to please introduce uh, the speaker. Dr. I'll begin with, I'll thank Professor Ranganathan to accept our invitation to take this talk uh, for today online. And before going any further, I'll request all to once again check and please kindly mute yourself so as to not disturb the proceedings. Mm -hmm. Please, I'll again I'll once again mute yourself, all of you. And uh, I will quickly, you know, introduce uh, Professor Ranganathan to all of you. So, as you have all seen, that Professor Ranganathan is. Uh, oral and maxillofacial pathologist from Ragas Dental College, having graduated from Madras University. And he has done both MDS, MS, as well as he has also completed his PhD. Uh, he's a fellow of uh, American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology. And he's also a fellow of Indian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, uh, pathologist. Uh, he has the proud privilege to be the first Indian to be the Secretary of International Association of uh, Oral Pathology, Pathologists, and he's also the Chairperson of Fellowship Committee for Indian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathologists. In the past, he has been the President of Association of Indian Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, as well as he has many other posts which he has generated, as shown on the slide. He's a recognized PhD guide with NGR University, 
Chennai as well as SRM University. Uh, he is also a member of multiple boards of studies, including the NTR University, and is part of faculty appraisal committee as well as he is a, a visiting professor in the University of Malaya. Uh, he has multiple research awards, as you all can see in the slide, and he's also uh, uh, he's received in the past award more than 10 years back, the Best Teacher Award from MGR University. He's a referee for multiple uh, journals, national and international, and his primary interests are in oral and precancerous lesions, including OSF, HIV, and stem cell research. Sir has published more than almost just short of 200 mm -hmm. publications. And he has contributed multiple textbooks and chapters. He has made numerous presentations, including the one which we are, will be privileged to listen to. And uh, he has guided almost 126 students till date. So I'll stop here for the day and I'll request Professor Ranganathan to now take on the stage where we have the faculty as well as the students, postgraduate students who will be attending and listening to your valuable talks. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and a very, very good afternoon to you all. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, can you hear? Yeah, great. Uh, first, let me just start by sharing my screen so that you know we get that out of the way. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. We can see it. Awesome. Um, first, let me uh, let me extend my thanks to Dr. Sen for having uh, reached out to me uh, on this. I must say, very very difficult topic to talk to because uh, uh, this is a very very mixed audience and. Uh, the first thing I asked him when I had sort of speaking to him was, uh, who exactly is my target audience? And um, he was telling me it's going to be interns, students, uh, and uh, maybe the faculty will also join in. And uh, from what little I could see of the screenshot, uh, people have been kind enough to join from different places, from operating theaters, clinics. I saw one in the car. So it's um, it's a little bit daunting to you know uh, cover this uh, in-depth topic uh, to sort of satisfy everybody. And uh, I did ask him to, you know, give me some pointers as to what exactly uh, the audience would be looking for. Sort of the way, yeah. And uh, he sent me these four um, articles, actually. And uh, okay. And I think the highlight of these four topics were uh, basically genetics uh, in general oral health, uh, genetic disorders affecting teeth. Uh, one particular study which talks about uh, genome-wide association. And then, of course, molecular basis of different oral uh, diseases. Man, this, this is a very, very broad topic. And uh, got me thinking, actually. And I sort of could narrow it down that uh, this is what... Uh, I need to be talking about genetic studies, uh, molecular studies, especially targeting DNA, RNA, and protein. And uh, finally, I'll talk about application. Uh, the first two components, actually, I'm going to talk about oh, the okay, basics. Okay. Uh, I sorry. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about the basics. Uh, and this would be targeted at essentially postgraduates and anybody starting on molecular research. And this is something you need to know if you're going to use very advanced techniques later on. And if you do not have a grasp of these basic techniques, it's really going to be difficult to understand some of the recent techniques. The last component in the application, and I'll actually talk about the latest techniques which are available, and this would be more targeted at the faculty. And okay. this is going to be very brief. Uh, I could expand on this if necessary. Um, there was one about regenerative techniques in the article uh, which uh, Dr. Sen had kindly sent over. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that here today, uh, but if anybody is interested, I have a link site. Uh, this is one of my recent presentations to the endodontist on uh, regenerative endodontics. Uh, I cover a lot about the recent materials and how exactly regeneration works. 
it's available on YouTube. Or uh, if you're interested, you could please uh, go through that. And if you have any doubts, you can get back to me. Um, why do you need to study these? If you're a postgraduate or somebody starting out in research, uh, sometimes I find this is the most difficult question to answer. Uh, of course, one answer is I need to do a dissertation or a project. Uh, that's one answer. But what exactly is that you're trying to find out? So this thing has got... So I think you went on mute. We are unable oh. to... Hear. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Okay, when did I go on mute? Quite some time back or? No, no, just now, sir. Just now. Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the two components to this one, uh, the research component and the clinical component. And as dental surgeons, I think our, our strength is really the clinical component. And so when you want to start doing research, uh, the first thing you need to really be asking is, what exactly would you like to answer in the clinical context? Are you looking at a diagnostic technique or want to improve your diagnosis or diagnosis a rare con or involves diagnosis of a rare condition or improve a current practice, no matter what speciality you are by, you know, whatever procedure you're using, you want to shorten the time, uh, be it orthodontics or endodontics, make it more cost effective, improve the technique, as far as the ability to use this or to make it a little bit more simple. And of course, uh, a lot of work has been done on material innovation, whether you could do an indigenous material to replace the more expensive imported material, or you could improve on a material which is already available. And if like me, you're involved with uh, oral pathology and oral medicine, you would like to talk about prognosis of disease, uh, that could also include prognosis of a restoration, prognosis of an orthodontic treatment, or prognosis of an endodontic treatment. So prognosis could be any treatment. Uh, would you like to address a research component as to how you can uh, enhance that? Uh, coming to the research part, now I think this is very important. Uh, when you're going to work on these areas, you should have a very, very strong rationale, a very clear-cut research question, based on which uh, you have a very clear-cut hypothesis, aims, and objective. And this is this totally a separate topic on research methodology, and I'm not going to go into it. But it's important to understand that whenever we talk about technique, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it is closely connected to what you want to do clinically and how we are going to do the research. Uh, uh, am I audible? I think it's some disturbance, yeah. Uh, how we are going to do the research. So. Any technique which I talk about would not make any sense if your clinical component and the research component is not very strong. So the technique is subservient to your clinical question which you want to answer and the research design you want to do based upon your clinical question. And the technique comes the last, actually. The next question is, uh, how do you study these and what exactly you're talking about? So like I said, you need to have a very clear rationale you have a one distinct research question. I have done this mistake, and I know a lot of people who start research too, they would have multiple questions to answer, multiple problems to address. Then choosing a technique, including a molecular technique, becomes very difficult, and the feasibility of the study falls flat. And if at all you need to take one take-home message about research from this presentation, it is that have a very clear-cut, one distinct research question. And if your research question is very clear, you will know what you're going to measure, what we call as the variable in your study. And once you know the variable, then you will decide on the technique, no matter what molecular technique you're going to do. So you need to have a very clear problem, clinical problem that you're going to address. Based on that, have a very, very sturdy research design. And once you have a study design, which is very good, find out what you want to measure, what is the variable, then you come to the technique, some of which we're going to discuss today. And the question is, what is the technique we use? I, a lot of times I have students walking into my room and saying, I want to do PCR of this. I want to do ELISA of this. I want to do karyotyping of this. That's, that's not the way to approach a problem. Your technique is influenced by the clinical question which you're going to ask. And it should never be the other way around. 
uh, just because you have a fantastic new PCR machine in your central research lab uh, doesn't mean that uh, you need to have a project around that PCR. It should be based on the clinical question that you're addressing. And this is, this is very important. And for anybody who's starting research is one thing I'd like to emphasize. So when you have a hammer, everything becomes a nail, but you need to understand that uh, the wrong sort of nail you use the technique, uh, it's going to be a problem. Uh, many a times uh, I have projects uh, which come in with a huge uh, genome-wide analysis and real-time PCR as the technique. But if you look at the question, uh, something as simple as an immunohistochemistry would answer the question. So, uh, so the, the, once again, to reemphasize, uh, the research question and what you're looking for besides the technique. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now let's come to the topic of the day. I realize that you all come from different specialities and it makes it a little bit tricky for me to take examples. So I kept this very, very broad list. You could be looking at anomalies. Uh, you could be looking at dental caries. You could be looking at periodontitis. You could be looking at bone response. Uh, if you're a surgeon or an orthodontist, you could be looking at dysbiosis, which is a very big thing today in oral health. Uh, even dental caries, we talk about it as a dysbiosis, uh, not as something being caused by one particular microorganism, be it streptococcus mutans or something related. So all these processes, whether it is an anomaly or a curious process or an inflammatory process, they could all be classified as either an inflammatory disease, a metabolic disease, a neoplastic disease, or a development disease. And each of these, you can use a particular molecular technique. I mean, all of these, you could use all the molecular techniques I'm going to talk about today. But one particular technique for one particular problem is usually the one which is very efficient. And let me see if I can make you sort of grasp that point as we get along in this presentation. Any of these disease uh, is actually fundamentally or finally caused by a biochemical substance, be it uh, anomaly of a bone, which is influenced by bone morphogenic protein or something which happens to the collagen matrix, be it dental caries, where there is demineralization of the inorganic and destruction of the organic periodontitis, inflammatory response, dysbiosis by the exotoxins or the endotoxins produced by microorganisms. Eventually, these are produced by chemicals, which could be cytokines or inflammatory mediators. So you could study these using molecular techniques. And these cytokines or inflammatory mediators are obtained from proteins or metabolites. I'll talk about them a little bit in detail as I progress. And these proteins are in turn obtained from translation from the ribonucleic acid, which is the RNA. And the RNA is transcribed from the DNA. And this may sound a little bit basic, but please stay here with me. And a bunch of genes, a bunch of DNA, which has a particular codes for a particular characteristic is what is called a gene. So a gene is nothing but a group of DNA. And these genes are present on chromosomes, which are present in the cell, nucleus of the cell, which are present in the tissue, and which finally uh, the reason why you're studying these is because there's some problem within the oral or oral and maxillofacial region. So all these list of conditions you have on your left, you could study them at any of these levels as a research question. You can study them purely from the clinical context. You can look at them at the tissue under a microscope. You can look cytology under a cell and do research on that. Uh, we have some fantastic genetic techniques from a single cell you could do. I'll talk about that towards the end of the presentation. You could look at the chromosomes uh, which are initiating this problem through genes and the DNA or how the DNA sort of transcribes the RNA and translates the protein. And eventually these are going to cause, create a bunch of chemicals which are responsible for all these problems that you're trying to do research on. So analyzing any of these, the cytokines or the proteins or the RNA or the DNA or the genes or the chromosome constitute molecular technique. So that is the fundamental basis of molecular techniques in disease of the head and neck region. So molecular techniques could study genes or chromosomes, a DNA, RNA, proteins, which you could broadly divide as structural proteins and functional proteins like enzymes. If you study genes, just to get a few terminology out of the way, it's called genomics. DNA to RNA is called transcriptomics. Formation of proteins, study of proteins is called proteomics. 
and how proteins interact with one another to form the metabolism of the cell and the final function or the physiology of the body is called metabolomics. And now we realize that in addition to genes, there are some substances outside the genes which can also influence characters and properties and diseases of the human body. And we call them epigenetics. And this is a big branch of science by itself. Obviously, I'll not be able to cover all of these today. So let's look at some of the techniques which I'm going to be talking about today. You have karyotyping, and you have what's called restriction fragment link polymorphism. Then you have DNA sequencing. You have in-situ hybridization. You have fluorescent in-situ hybridization or what's called as FISH, which you must have heard about. You have the different blotting techniques, like a southern for DNA, northern for RNA, and western for proteins. And you have the well-known polymerase chain reaction. And then for proteins, you have ELISA and immunohistochemistry. One quick thing to notice, those which are underlined with the red line, these you could study within the tissues. So you will be able to localize exactly where the problem is. For example, if you're looking at bone physiology and you're looking at, say, bone morphogenic protein or osteocalcin, you could use in situ and immunohistochemistry to find out which cell is exactly producing bone morphogenic protein or osteocalcin. Whereas all the other techniques, you basically extract the DNA or the RNA or the uh, genes from them and then study them. So you will know if the bone is expressing them or not expressing them, but you will not be able to localize. So molecular techniques can be broadly divided as where you could exactly localize on the chromosome or the tissue, which include in situ and fish and immunohistochemistry, or those which will tell you whether it's increased or decreased or present or absent but you may not know exactly which component of the cell or tissue is contributing to that particular change. I will not talk much about immunohistochemistry in this session because I think almost everybody is aware of what it is. It's just, and it's so rampantly and commonly used that uh, I think everybody is comfortable with how the technique works, and how to use it. And once you look at those techniques, you'll realize that, oh my God, I studied this in the third year or in the first year of basic sciences. And well, what about all the new techniques? Why is he not talking about new techniques? Uh, you need to understand that all the new techniques uh, which we talk about, be it flow cytometry, multiplex PCR, microscopy-based DNA imaging, massive parallel sequencing, gene genome perturbation tools, advanced biochemical techniques, spatial genomics, single cell genomics, spatial transcriptomics, single cell RNA sequencing, all of these are based on the basic techniques which I showed you on the slide, the karyotyping, the blotting, in-situ hybridization, and the ELISA technique. That is the fundamental basis. And if you do not understand or grasp the basics, these techniques are going to be very, very difficult to understand. So basically all the modern techniques which we talk about, and I'll talk about that during the end of the presentation, are what are called high throughput refinement of the basic techniques. So basically you take a PCR or you take a karyotyping or you take a DNA analysis sequencing and then put it into a machine which can do it very, very rapidly and a huge number of samples at the same time. So very rapid, large number of samples at the same time, they become the modern day techniques. But all these are based on a thorough and a fundamental knowledge of the basic techniques uh, in molecular biology. And that's what we are going to talk about today. And this is another question which often comes, what technique do you use? And like I said, any clinical disease could be studied at a different levels, cellular level, the genetic level, or the chromosomal level. So you could do at any of these techniques, chromosomes, genes, DNA, RNA, protein, any clinical question you could study at this stage. It may be developmental anomalies or syndromes, diagnostic markers, prognostic markers or pathogens, study about toxins, cytokines, or immunology. Or you could study at any of these levels. And the techniques which correspond to this are if you want to study chromosomes, you use karyotyping, or fluorescent in situ hybridization, or just in situ hybridization for genes, DNA sequencing and blotting for DNA, RNA, and protein, PCR for DNA or RNA. ELISA and immunohistochemistry for protein and metabolic products within the tissue or cell. So these are the molecular techniques which are ideally matched to what you want to study in the tissue of interest or in the cell of interest 
or the clinical question you want to address. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all the basic techniques very, very quickly. I'm not going to tell you how to do them. That would be each one would be a separate topic in itself. But what is the okay. principle that you should be aware that you should be aware of if you're going to choose it for your research project? Basically, how is it done so that you will know what exactly you need to do this, these studies and where exactly you can apply them. And I'm going to keep the examples very broad because I realize you all come from different specialities. So I will keep it very broad. Now, towards the end of the session, if you have any specific question, please do ask me. All right, karyotyping is pretty much fundamental. And you must have seen this picture of, of in your undergraduate level or in your basic sciences level. What exactly does it mean? Put very simply, you basically take a cell, separate out all the chromosomes within the cell, and you put it in a very neat pattern called the karyogram or the ideogram. So basically pairing and placing all the chromosomes as a single snapshot, which you could then analyze. So you usually use mitotic cells. And uh, once again, many a time I ask a student, where exactly do you get the cell from? Everybody's seen this karyotype, but where do you get the cells on which you do the karyotype? Basically, you can use any tissues, but the most common one which is used for developmental anomalies is what is called the peripheral blood lymphocytes. You basically withdraw the blood, use the lymphocytes, expand the lymphocytes using a mitogen, stop it in metaphase, and then under, put it through a series of procedures wherein you can get the chromosomes and analyze. And I'll tell you what exactly you can analyze. You could also use tumor biopsies or bone marrow samples to do a karyotyping. And in the case of prenatal diagnosis during pregnancy, uh, you use either the cells from the amniotic fluid or the chorionic villus. So any of these tissue can be used uh, to do karyotyping. And like I said, the picture which you get is called the karyogram or the ideogram. And you could stain the chromosomes in different ways. And these are some of the common ways, what's called G-banding, R-banding, C-banding, and Q-banding. Let me quickly go through what each of them do. G stands for game sustaining. And uh, this it gives you a pattern which is shared between individuals of a particular species. So there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. I'm sure you're aware of that. If you look at the G-banding, there may be about 400 to 800 G-bands. And the G-bands actually stain those parts of the chromosomes which are not functionally active. So they are really not functionally active, but that particular pattern is very characteristic of species. It's shared by all the individuals in the species. So it has got its own role. If you denature the chromosome, not sort of subject them to heat, and then again do the gene sustaining, you get what is called the R banding, or what's called the reverse banding from gene sum. So those which the gene sum doesn't stain, the R band takes up. And the R banding is very good to look at functional component of the chromosome, by which I mean genes which are responsible for a particular character. So these will stain the gene-rich regions, particularly those located near the telomeres. The C-banding technique, the C stands for centromeres, are very important to study what are called the satellite DNAs of acrocentric chromosomes in certain developmental anomalies. These are what are called adenine permanent rich areas, or what are called the AT rich areas. The Q banding is in fact one of the earliest banding technique which was introduced. Uh, this is using quinacrine, and this can be used to study chromosomal translocations like in different types of leukemias and any disorder involving the Y chromosome of the XY sex chromosome pair. So the, the point here you need to understand is once you separate out the chromosomes, you can use these techniques to study any particular area of interest in the chromosome. And what exactly is this area of interest? You can find out if the numbers of the chromosomes are abnormal or if the chromosomes are structurally abnormal. So both these can be studied. Um, once again, with respect to numbers, we have all these terms, euploid, which is 2n, which is normal, polyploid, 3n, by n we mean 23, so 2 into 23, 46. Polyploid is 3 into 23, triploid, aneuploid, where there is an, any odd number of increase from the uh, euploid type, mosaicism, where some cells have uh, one number, other cells have different numbers. A chimera is a fusion of two different cell lines, and you get that in some conditions. So these are all the numer numerical 
abnormalities of the chromosomes which you get studying. A classic example would be Down syndrome, and all of you know about the trisomy 21, and uh, an extra X chromosome in Kleinfelter syndrome. You can look at this. You need to have only one X and Y. You see two X chromosomes right here. You see that? And Down syndrome, you see three chromosomes right there. So, so these can be studied using oh. karyotyping. Uh, structural disorders uh, are there in different tumors, including oral diseases. Uh, these include deletion, duplication, inversion, insertion, translocation, something called ring chromosome, which is not there in this picture. So the, the take home message here is, if you want to study a developmental anomaly where you feel that the chromosome is abnormal, you can do a karyotyping of the chromosome using either the peripheral blood lymphocytes or the tissue of interest. And you could do a banding technique depending on what exactly you're interested in looking at. And you can look for numerical abnormalities or structural abnormalities, which will address your clinical question. So, uh, and these could be chromosomal disorders such as Downs, Turners, and Kleinfelters. Or you could look for single gene defects which happen in neurofibromatosis or tuberculosis. We use a different technique for that. Multifactorial genetic disorders like diabetes and the somatic mutations such as mosaicism and those which happen in neoplasia. These are some of the genetic diseases you can study using either chromosomal techniques or some of the techniques which I'm going to talk about on the next few slides. Okay, uh, to study single genes or a mutation in a particular gene, um, right there. So this mutation, you know, is a heritable alteration of the DNA. Uh, you have different molecular techniques. And what exactly you can do to do these genetic studies? There are a couple of different ways. One of the simplest clinical way which you could do for an inherited abnormality because of the mutation is something called the pedigree chart. You don't need uh, any huge laboratory facility. In fact, you could trace back the proband uh, which is the person who has the disease, draw up a family chart or what is called a pedigree chart with symbols representing a particular characteristic. And uh, you can actually trace out what exactly is going on. Or you could do an in-situ hybridization based on fluorescence, which is what's called the fish, blotting and RFLP I'll talk about briefly. Or you could sequence the DNA of interest after isolating it uh, from the disease condition and then you can expand it using PCR or polymerase chain reaction. Our pedigree chart um, is very simple. Uh, it's uh, simple in the sense it's very cost effective. The problem is you need access to patients, which you may not have many a times. But you could use this to study single gene defects, chromosomal disorders, multifactorial disorders, and somatic maturation. All of these you could study. And uh, you get a chart like this, which I'm sure you have seen, uh, by which we classify a disease as autosomal dominant, recessive, or sex-linked. So basically, you have a symbol for a male and a female, and you have the alphabets indicating the gene of interest. Uh, and uh, if they are same, it is called homozygous. If they're different, it's called heterozygous. You track down the siblings and multiple families and see who has got the disease. Uh, that's, that's how a pedigree chart works. Uh, you could do this for autosomal dominant diseases. Uh, you can have a pedigree chart for autosomal recessive diseases. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about each of these details, uh, but the slide is there. You could always um, go back to them and take a look at it. Or you could do X-linked recessive diseases. Uh, and these can also be studied using pedigree chart if you have access to patients, the families, and the family history. And you could study multiple things. You could study single gene disorders, chromosomal, multifactorial problems. You can look at the prevalence, the pattern of inheritance, and the risk to relatives. Because that's a question which you'll face in a clinical context. Uh, a patient has a particular disease. They would ask, is my child going to get it? Can I get married? Uh, so the pattern of inheritance and risk to relatives is, is very, very important. And uh, the pedigree chart is one which helps you to counsel the patients on that particular problem. Uh, if it's a single gene, uh, there's numerous prevalence, and the pattern of inheritance is very clear, and the risk to relatives is high, so genetic counseling becomes easy. Uh, if it's chromosomal, these are relatively rare, like Down syndrome, the pattern of inheritance sometimes tends to be not very clear because many chromosomal disorders are caused because of teratogenic effects during pregnancy, and that then, then it becomes a little... And that includes uh, lesions like cleft lip and cleft palate in the clinical context of dentistry. 
And many of these have very low risk to relatives because it's an environmental factor to the developing embryo. Uh, multifactorial, like diabetes and hypertension, inheritance pattern tends to be not very clear. And the counseling of the relatives based on risk pattern is going to be extremely difficult. Okay, this is broadly how we would study genetic diseases uh, in the clinical context using pedigree chart and how it would help you to counsel the patients. The next technique we're going to talk about is fluorescent in-situ hybridization, a widely used molecular techniques for different purposes, but this is based on a concept of DNA hybridization, which came in first. So what exactly do we mean by DNA hybridization? You're all aware of the DNA double helix, uh, when it is heated to a particular temperature in a particular pH, the strands separate out. And then when you cool them, they rejoin. So when these separate out, you could add a marker, which would then attach to the piece of DNA that you are interested. Uh, this is very much like at the expense of oversimplification. You must have all seen a slide at some point in time stained by hematoxylin and eosin. And the moment you use hematoxylin, the hematoxylin latches onto the nucleus because of its pH difference, because nucleic acid is acidic and hematoxylin is basic. They lock in, and then you look at it under the microscope. So similarly, you can separate out the DNA. So you can separate out, sorry, for that. excuse me. Yeah. So separate out the DNA, and then you can attach a marker, just like I talked about hematoxylin or an antibody in immunohistochemistry. It will anneal, it will join, it will combine with the template of the DNA, and then you could stain it or attach a fluorescent probe and then sort of look at it. So this concept of connecting two DNA strands, one of which has got a probe such as a fluorescent molecule is what is called hybridization. And this is possible because you can separate out the DNA at a particular temperature and pH and join it back. And this is a very powerful technique by which you can study specific sequences of the nucleotides in DNA and RNA. And this in-situ hybridization can be done at the level of the chromosomes or at the level of tissues. I mean, you could do a karyotype and then you can do the in-situ hybridization of chromosomes. They use what are called DNA probes because chromosomes contain DNA. You can map gene sequences. I'll show you a few pictures how it is done. And when you use a fluorescent dye instead of a radioactive dye, which is what is commonly used, which was what, is, what was used earlier, radioactive uh, tagged molecules, you use fluorescent so that you can visualize it under the microscope. It is called fluorescent in situ hybridization. So you can look at it exactly as to which part of the chromosome contains the region of interest. Or you could do it in a tissue. They use what is called RNA probes, either in cells or in tissues. You can identify the particular gene that you are interested in and see how it is distributed and you can do analyze and the analysis. So the fluorescent in situ hybridization is based on the concept of the capacity for us to separate out the DNA strands and then rehybridize them under specific conditions. And you could do that on the chromosome from your karyotype, or you can do that in tissues uh, which you take as a biopsy or, uh, you know, from any other, or looking at microbiome from the a plaque or a swab from the oral cavity. So what exactly is fish? Like I said, if you look at this picture, the bright red, you know, double standard area is what is called the fluorescent labeled DNA probe. This is the DNA, which is called the target DNA, which you're going to study. You separate them out by denaturing, as I explained, and then you allow them to hybridize. And then you look for the fluorescence and then you know where exactly in the chromosome it is. And then you draw an inference based on what you're studying. Now, there are different ways in which you can use fish. If you want to study the centromeric region, you have a centromeric fish, chromosome specific. You could paint the whole chromosome. Uh, you could do what's called reverse painting. And I'll show you an example. You could do what is called multicolor spectral karyotyping. Or you can do what is, you must have come across this in numerous articles called comparative genomic hybridization or CGH. Uh, these are a few examples of fish or fluorescent in situ hybridization drawn from the, uh, the literature. Uh, this is actually for centromere. You can see all these green dots. They actually stain the centromere component of the chromosome. And the dye used is FITC, thiocyanate. 
And uh, this is very chromosome specific. So you have the red staining the chromosome two and the green staining the chromosome 16. So you can actually identify chromosomes uh, using this technique. A reverse painting, um, this is very interesting. Uh, here, what we do is we take the DNA of interest and then hybridize it with the karyotype, with the normal karyotype. This works reverse to what we normally do. And uh, it is very useful in studying leukemias of certain types. Um, this is actually in an acute promyelocytic leukemia patient where you have what is called uh, the translocation of 15 and 17, uh, which shows up uh, in this fluorescent uh, in situ hybridization. And then you can actually label each of the chromosomes separately. This is what are called whole chromosome paint probes. So you can identify each of them separately as 1, 3, 4, 16, 8, depending upon whichever chromosome you're interested in, and then segregate it out and then analyze it. So all these are possible uh, with fluorescent in situ hybridization. So it's a very, very versatile technique. And the advantage is you can exactly see in which chromosome the region or your region of interest as far as your research question is concerned. Or you could use an RNA probe and look at it in cells and tissues which you have obtained from the patient or salivary fluid or from your plaque samples if you're looking at cells there. So this, this actually tells you where exactly the problem is. And that localization uh, makes it a very, very powerful molecular research tool. Then we move on to some techniques which are used very commonly. And uh, these have been used for many years and later adapted to high throughput techniques. And you need to know at least what these mean uh, if you're going to start using molecular techniques. Uh, one of them is what is called restriction fragment-like polymorphism or RFLP and blotting. So these are used together and I'll show you how. In fact, RFLP is one of the first generation of DNA marker used many years back. And this uses the property of certain enzymes called restriction endonucleases. And these cut the DNA at very specific base sequences. I'm sure you're aware that the human genome has got about anywhere between 50,000 to 100,000 genes. So what these restriction enzymes do is cut the DNA. And interestingly, most of the endonucleases cut it in non-genetic areas. So if you look at the DNA, you have segments of DNA which express certain properties with other genetic areas. And there are ex segments which do not have any property that we are aware of. And uh, when you talk about DNA, we call them as exons and introns. Exons are those which are expressed. Introns are between two exons. They are intermediate between two exons. And many of them, they do have some function. That's what we realize now, but we don't know what exactly they function to. So the endonucleases cut them at these particular points. And they cut them in definite lengths in each individual. So this makes it a very, very versatile tool. And they cut it at very, very specific sequences. Now, in fact, this is such an important fundamental basis of different molecular techniques uh, that the scientists were awarded the Nobel Prize way back in 1978 and forms the backbone of most of the modern molecular techniques. And what exactly you can do with RFLP, you can do what is called the genome mapping. I'll talk about the hemo human genome uh, mapping shortly. You could do genotyping widely used in forensics. And if you're into forensic odontology, you should know what RFLP is. It is used in paternity tests uh, to test if the particular kid's father or mother is this particular person in the in legal uh, uh, environment. It can use, be used to diagnose hereditary disease, widely used in different diagnostic aspects of, and human disease. Well, quickly, this is what happens. You extract the DNA you subject it to this enzyme called restriction endonucleases. You put it on a gel. I'm sure you have seen pictures of these or use it in your lab. And these are the wells in which you put the substance. And then you subject them to an electricity current. So the endonucleases cut them in different sequence. So each of them is cut in a very, very definite pattern, which is characteristic for that particular individual. And then when you run, when you put the DNA, the segmented DNA in this gel, the different fragments move. Uh, the negative is the cathode and the positive is the anode. As the DNA is negatively charged, it moves towards the anode. It moves towards the positive component of the gel. And then you have all these lines, which I'm sure you have seen, which are actually the DNA fragments. And you can separate these DNA fragments out 
and do whatever study you want. You can sequence them, you can do a PCR, or you can just study them just like that uh, for genotyping. So, like I said, it moves. The smaller DNA moves faster towards the anode, and the larger DNAs move a little bit slow. So depending upon how far they have migrated in the agar gel over a period of time, you can actually find out how many base pairs the DNA is or how big the DNA of interest is. And you can look at the disease. For example, here uh, you have the restriction endonuclease map of a normal patient, and here it is there in disease. And when you combine or compare these two, you see these red lines, which are different between normal and disease. So the normal has these two red lines here, which is missing in disease, whereas the disease has a larger DNA molecule right there, uh, which is absent to normal. And you can separate these migrated fragments and study. And you can use these RFL markers, like I said, to find out you know, genotype in the families, to look at the family hierarchy. And this is also useful uh, in finding out who's the father or mother of a child, parenting, in forensic odontology to find out if it's coming from a particular individual or if it's from an individual who's related to another individual. So these banding patterns which you see in red are very, very characteristic for an individual and the descendants or siblings of that particular individual. And it's a very, very versatile, very simple, very elegant molecular tool which can be used uh, in your lab. And I said these DNA fragments which are migrated in the gel can be further studied. How do you study these? They're all in the gel. Now, how do you transfer them into a media in which you can study them? Blotting. And blotting exactly means what it means. You take the gel with all these migrated fragments, you put what is called a nitrocellulose paper on top of this, a lot of towels and blotting paper. The nitrocellulose absorbs the DNA fragment. You separate out the nitrocellulose sheet, and this you can use, either you can use a radioactive probe or a fluorescent in-situ hybridization or any other molecular technique to analyze it further. So the fragments which you get in RFLP is on a gel. You can blot it out on a nitrocellulose paper. You can separate out the nitrocellulose sheet, I'm sorry, nitrocellulose sheet. And then you can use any staining technique that you want or any other molecular technique you want to look at those fragments which are separated out so that you can characterize them and you can analyze them. So this combination of RLP and blotting is a very simple, elegant, and powerful tool for different genetic and molecular studies. And they go by different names. Uh, if you want to study DNA, it's called Southern Blot after the person who first described it. And Northern and Western were named as a tongue-in-cheek uh, paraphrasing of Southern Blot. If you want to study RNA, you do northern blot. And if you want to study proteins, uh, you do western blot. Okay, you have the DNA of interest, but you need to know what exactly is the sequence if you need to do gene therapy, like what is called, you must have all heard about the CRISPR-Cas9 technique, which has been very popular in the news of late. How do you know what exactly is the code in these DNA segments, which you have realized is abnormal and normal and in disease? For that, use a technique called DNA sequencing. And this was developed way back in the 1970s by Sanger, what is called the Sanger sequencing, uh, for which once again in 1980, the Nobel Prize was awarded to uh, Gilbert and Sanger. It's got a tremendous application. You can identify MAP genes and regulatory sequence. And this sequencing is the backbone of the human genome project, the cancer genome project. And many of the projects in which we are trying to characterize the genetic map of that particular condition, be it normal or disease. Or you can compare homologous sequences in different organisms, study them, how they've evolved across species, diagnosis and forensics in population genetics. Uh, this is very, very important. Uh, in mass population genetics, sequencing is a very, very powerful tool in which you can study different types of polymorphisms and why certain diseases are common in certain parts of the country. And of course, uh, it's got some role in wildlife management uh, where you track species and see how exactly they are reproducing and how exactly they are propagated among the species. So basically, this is used to determine the nucleotide sequence. It's been mentored way back in the 1970. And the technique which Sanger used is what is called the termination method. 
So this is a procedure in which uh, you use what is called dideoxynucleotides. So this is where you combine them uh, with nucleotides to sequence the DNA, and you mix certain molecules which do not have hydroxyl group uh, so that it stops the reaction in different segments and which enables you to study the nucleotide sequence. Um, I mean, let me skip that. Um, so this is this sequencing technique uh, has advanced over the period of years from 1970 from the first generation Sanger sequencing. Uh, now we have what is called the NGS, which is a very common abbreviation everybody uses, which is called next generation sequencing or what's called massively parallel or second generation sequencing. Then you have third generation sequencing. And this forms the backbone of whole genome sequencing, the human genome project in which uh, we mapped the entire human genome. I think it started in uh, 1990 and by the end of 2013, we have mapped the genome. And then you have the cancer genome atlas for almost 30 different types of cancers. And you have the genome mapping for very complex and rare diseases. So this fundamental Sanger technique, uh, which is basically using the blotting and the gel procedure, which I told you earlier, and DDNTPs, has been modified by advancement in machine technology. And you can do, like I said, right in the beginning, this, this sequencing procedure, which you do on a single gel in the lab, you can do multiple of these within a short period of time, uh, which is what is called massive parallel DNA sequencing or you can do them using specific pores, what is called nanopore DNA sequencing. These are all newer techniques, but these are essentially based on the Sanger sequencing technique and its variations, which have been automated to make it very fast, very quick, and relatively cost-effective. Um, it's come to a stage in which with uh, about $1,000, you could sequence a genome for a particular individual. And uh, there are labs which can do as much as 100,000 genomes very rapidly in a short span of a few days. Um, all this is fine if you have a lot of tissue and a lot of genes, but what if you have very little genetic material or you just want to study one particular gene of interest in one particular area, and you've heard of the term SNPs, uh, what is called uh, single nucleotide polymorphism, and, but you don't have much DNA to work with. Okay, let me make it easy for you to understand. Think Jurassic Park. You have one particular DNA and you want to create an entire dinosaur. So you have very little DNA, but you want to study. What do you do then? Then comes the very, very widely used polymerase chain reaction of PCR. It solves two problems in the labs. When you have very little genetic material, you can amplify it significantly. And it's a very powerful amplification protocol. Second, it's extremely specific. So you need to know what exactly you're looking at that's a disadvantage. The advantage is if you're looking at a very particular gene, you do not have to fish around. And I don't mean the fluorescent in situ hybridization. You don't have to keep looking around. You can exactly target a particular sequence and look at it. So the advantage of polymerase chain reaction is it's extremely specific if done correctly. And it can amplify even very small amounts of genetic material to amounts in which you could do a lot of laboratory work. So. PCR is used to identify, quantify, or amplify segments of DNA of interest. And it does exactly what happens to the DNA replication within the body. And that happens at the body temperature. Uh, we have a particular enzyme which works at a higher temperature outside the body. And we use that and we exactly reproduce what happens within the body during mitosis and meiosis. It can study and identify genes in tumor, infections, and the microbiome. Uh, quickly, you have this machine, you add a bunch of chemicals inside. Uh, it's, it's, it's all been automated now, and these machines are not very expensive. So almost every other lab has a PCR machine. So what it does is it does exactly the first step like we saw in hybridization. It denatures the DNA segment so that it separates into two. And then you add what are called primers, which will duplicate the separated DNA fragments. Then you do what make them join by means of a process called annealing. And then you extend the DNA fragment so you get the entire DNA by means of extension. So denaturation, adding primer, annealing, and then extension. So that's the single molecule which you amplify. It's so powerful that with the single DNA, if you have enough of primers and the ingredients needed for amplification, by the 35th cycle, you can have as much as 68 billion copies of the DNA from a single DNA. 
You can do 32 cycles or 35 cycles within a matter of a couple of hours. So with a single DNA, you can amplify it. So it's so versatile and it is so specific. And there are different modifications to PCR. Uh, you have what's called the conventional, the reverse, the asymmetric, inverse, nested, anchored. Uh, there are so many modifications. But there are two which you need to know, and I shall talk about that quickly. This is what is called the conventional and what is called the real-time PCR, or it's called RT-PCR or qPCR. And this is widely used in research now. In the conventional PCR, you use ampli just amplify the DNA and look at what you get at the endpoint. Whereas in real-time PCR, I showed you the number of cycles from one cycle to 35 cycles. Normally we do about 24 to 32 cycles, you know, so by 24, 24 cycle, usually you get the product of interest. In real-time PCR, you can quantify after each of those amplification steps. I said first to the 25 steps. Each step you could actually quantify how much of amplification has happened. So the conventional is semi-quantitative and the real PCR is what is quantitative or you could use it as a qualitative when you're doing multiple real-time PCRs. So you basically use a fluorescent reporter molecule and the amplified portion is called the amplicon and you can keep track of the amplicon at each and every step. Uh, this is what happens and I'm sure you have seen this chart in any real-time PCR. It's very easy to understand. Uh, the x-axis shows you the number of cycles, zero cycles, 10 cycles, 20, 30, and 40. And this shows the fluorescence on the vertical axis, which means how much amplification has happened. The only thing which you need to know in this is this value. This is called as the concentration quotient. And the amplification is exponential. It increases and then reaches a plateau. So this value called CQ value actually tells you at what cycle the exponential system starts. So depending upon where the CQ value lies, whether it lies at the 20th cycle or the 10th cycle or the 30th cycle, you know how much molecule of DNA you had to start with. And this is a very, very important information you need. So you will know how much of template you had to start with, which in turn will tell you how many cycles you need to do and you'll be able to quantify it at each and put every stage. So if the CQ value, which you see right here is around the 20th cycle, it's around the 10th cycle, it means that you have a lot of template, which is what is called an early CQ value, and the amplification will happen, the exponential will happen very quickly. 20th cycle, probably later. And if it happens at the 30th cycle, you have the CQ value, then it means that you have very little primer to start with, and this is what is called as a late CQ. So this is commonly given uh, in most of the real-time PCR articles, and this is what it means. It gives you an idea as to how much of the molecule or DNA of interest was there in the specimen even before you started. And this information you cannot get from your conventional PCR, and that's why real-time PCRs are very, very versatile. And the advantage is you know the initial number, you could do this without all the gel electrophoresis I showed you in RFLP blotting and the sequencing. You don't need a gel for this. And chances of contaminations are re reduced. And post amplification manipulation, like which you need for conventional PCR, is absolutely eliminated. And so this forms a very versatile tool, molecular technique, which is commonly used in the laboratory. All this is fine. You know the DNA is there, the RNA is there, gene is there, but how do you know if it's functional or not? How do you know it is actively secreting a protein which is causing the disease? That is why many a times studying the gene, the DNA and the RNA may not be sufficient depending upon the clinical question that you're asking. You need to then study about the proteins or the metabolites as a consequence of this protein interaction. Uh, for this, you use what is called enzyme-linked immunoassay. Um, if I'm running out of time, please let me know. I'll skip some of these slides. Um, please do that uh, because I have just, I'll quickly rush through these. I'm sorry? Please continue. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, enzyme linked immunosorbent assay, what it's commonly called as ELISA. You'll hear a lot about this in all your articles and in your research protocols. This is based on the concept of antigen and antibody reaction, which happens in the immunity. Very simple. The molecule which you want to look for is an antigen. 
and the laboratory tool which you use to identify whether this antigen is present in your tissue, be it saliva, gingival cravicular fluid, or, or whole mouth fluid, is what is called as the antibody. So you look for the antigen, you take the antibody, allow them both to combine, and this antibody molecule has got a coloring agent, what is called as a promogen or a fluorescent molecule. And if the antigen is present, you see a particular color and you know it is present. And depending upon the amount of color, you know how much antigen you have. So any molecule which you're studying, be it a cytokine, being it a, be it an interferon, uh, any of those molecules in saliva, any molecule in the saliva, uh, any molecule in whole mouth fluid, any molecule in gingival critical fluid that you're looking for becomes the antigen. And the ELISA, we use something called the plate, is coated with the antibody, which is the technique to diagnose the antigen. And this antibody has got a coloring agent or a chromogen added to it, which will tell you if the antigen is there or not. So that's a fundamental principle of ELISA. It can measure any antigen. You can measure antibodies in the antibody. So if you want to measure IgG in your saliva, then the IgG becomes the antigen, though you call it an antibody, because you're looking for the IgG in saliva. So you can look like that. You can look for proteins, glycoproteins, cytokines, cell supernatant serum, and it's been used widely, salivary diagnostics, HIV, pregnancy tests. You can use all of these uh, with ELISA. So use what are called the 96 cell plates. I'll show you a picture very shortly. I'm sure most of you have seen it. These plates are coated with a special cell-derived substance so that the antigen and the antibody can stick onto them. And each ELISA measures a specific antigen. So for each antigen, you have one particular ELISA kit. And for those who are beginning in research, the moment you say, well, I mean, you, you, your imagination runs riot. You're thinking like these huge spaces, but uh, this is how it looks like. These small depressions are the well. You're looking at an ELISA plate, and these are numbered, and these are 96. So like I said, <clears throat> if you're looking at a particular antigen, these plates have got one particular antibody coated on them for each antigen you're looking at. Uh, it could be Slytherin, it could be lectin, it could be uh, whatever molecule you're looking for, whatever molecule you're looking for. Uh, <clears throat> this is that you have the antibody. Then you add the saliva or the gingival curricular fluid. If the antigen is there, it combines with the antibody. Then you add a substance which has got the color, an antibody which has got the color. And if there is a color present, you know the antigen is present. If it is not present, you know the antigen is not present. And depending upon how dark the color is, you will know how much concentration of the antigen is present. Is it in traces or is it in significant amounts? <clears throat> uh, and this can be modified in different techniques. And in interest of time, I will not go into it. There are different ways of coating it with antigen and antibody. So each of these represent this one particular bell you're looking at. And the most you could use, it could be quantitative or qualitative. And the four types of uh, coatings are, you could use what's called the direct technique, an indirect technique, a sandwich technique, and a competition. So these are different ways of coating antigens and antibodies and the diagnostic chromogen on top of that. So, but the principle is essentially the same. We are looking for an antigen, use an antibody, and an antibody with a coloring agent, which will tell you if the antigen is present and how much of the antigen is present. And this is what I meant. Uh, the top wells is what is called uh, sort of a calibration or standard well. So each of those numbers indicate different concentrations of the antigen, which is known, that is used for calibration. Excuse me. And these are the wells from your study samples. And you can see that they're of different intensities. So this indicates much of the antigen is present, and this probably a little bit less antigen is present. So the ELISA is very versatile in that it not only tells whether the molecule of interest you're studying is present, but also tells you how much of it is present. And that's very important. And how do you know that? Very simple. Um, let me quickly go back here. I said you have what is called a standard right on top, which is the known concentrations of the antigen and antibody, which you already add. This is something like a control or a standard. So we draw what is called an optical density chart of this. And that's what you're looking at here. Uh, this is at a, and these plates are read in a spectrophotometer, which is called an ELISA plate reader. This indicates, uh, the x-axis indicates in picograms, how much of the antigen is there in the standard sample. 
and the vertical axis tells you what is the color intensity. So for 50 picograms, this should be the color intensity. For 200, this should be the color intensity. So this is the standard which you draw for every antigen that you're studying or every molecule of interest that you're studying. And you take the color of all the other wells, you plot it, and depending upon where it falls in the plot, you know exactly what is the concentration of the molecule that you're interested in the clinical sample. So that's how ELISA works, simple. So antigen antibody reaction, the amount of color is plotted on a chart and you compare your sample with the standard chart and then you arrive at what concentration you're looking at in your study sample. And you can detect viruses, you can detect hormone levels using ELISA, infections, specific diseases, drugs, allergens in food, toxins, very, very versatile tool to look at proteins. And the biggest advantage with ELISA is you are looking at the proteins, which are the end molecules causing the disease. For a particular disease, even if DNA is there, it doesn't mean the DNA is functional and it is transcribing the RNA. Even if the RNA is there, it doesn't mean it is translating and producing the protein. So studying the protein actually gives you as to how much exactly the problem molecule that you're studying is present. And even if it is in traces, even in small concentrations, you can identify it. It's very fast, unlike all the other molecular techniques which you saw earlier. <clears throat> in 90 samples, because it's a 96 well, 90 patient samples you can study within two to three hours. <clears throat> very simple, very sensitive. Up to 10 picograms in a mill you can identify. Extremely specific because the antigen-antibody reaction is the basis of this analysis. Small amounts of sample, I'm all sure you're aware that the gingival cravicular fluid which you get is very, very small amount. You could use that amount. You could elute it into a medium and you could use that for analysis. So extremely small microliters can be studied and it's very easy to observe because it's very visual. Uh, you can test for antigen or antibody, multiple samples, extremely flexible and very easy to learn and very easy to do, unlike sequencing and blotting, which are expensive and difficult techniques, and they're very technique intensive. Okay, so these are the fundamental principles, molecular techniques on which all the modern age high throughput techniques are based. Now I will show you how these have been adapted and how we are going to use it. And one of the most fascinating fields, which I'm sure a lot of you are working on is the microbiome. Uh, the human microbiome is very interesting and uh, I'm sure you're aware, we almost have like 10 to 100 trillion, not billion, not million, trillion microorganisms in the body. And now it is felt that everything, right from your craving for sugar, craving for fat, craving for you know uh, any food material, your depression, many of diabetic process are influenced by the bacteria in your gut and in other parts of the body. And we feel that the oral microbiome also has got a significant impact on how disease is expressed and how disease uh, progresses in a particular individual. And this microbiome interacts with the microbiome in the environment, your food, in your soil, and whatever is around the environment in which the human being is. And all these together form what is the current concept of what is called as One Health. You will hear this a lot, the One Health. And this is all based on the microbiome in the individual, in the environment, and the multiple individuals in the community. So microbiomes are a very, very important aspect of studying any disease process, including oral disease process. And I'll just quickly, because this is a very rapidly evolving field, I spent just a few minutes on this. Uh, there are two terms which are commonly used, the microbiome and the microbiota. The microbiota of the oral cavity tells you about the bacteria, RK, which is a newer classification of certain groups of bacteria, fungi, and the protista and the algae. These organisms are called the microbiota. And these interact with your body, the environmental conditions within the substances produced by other bacteria within the proteins, peptides, lipids, polysaccharides, and nucleic acid present within your body. So they react within substances within your cell and tissue and the body fluids, and those in the environment in which you live in. So this is what is called the theater of activity. So the microbiota or the organisms, along with the internal and external or the internal and environmental factors, together constitute a very, very active 
physiological status, which is called the microbiome. And this is a very fascinating field, which is acquiring a lot of interest and rightly so. And I drew this, I uh, sort of uh, put this here, though it's a busy slime, just to drive home the fact that this is a One Health concept. All these use the techniques which I spoke about, the fundamental basis, the current knowledge of microbiome is based on all that we discussed today, the hybridization technique, the in-situ, the Sanger sequencing, the qualitative PCR, and the next generation sequencing. So if these were not there, and if you don't have a grasp of these fundamental techniques of sequencing and in-situ and qualitative, or what is called real-time PCR, you would not have the current knowledge or the explosion of knowledge of how actually disease occurs, be it the oral and maxillofacial region or the body as a whole. And that is why the techniques which we have seen today and which we have I've sort of put forth in front of you, it's absolutely essential you have a knowledge of these so that you understand the newer techniques. And like I said, our knowledge of the microbiome has improved based upon, you could study them at the cellular level, at the DNA level, at the RNA level, at the protein level or the metabolite. This is true for everything, the microbiome, periodontitis, gingivitis, your endodontic protocols, your bone physiology, um, did I leave out any, speci any speciality, wound healing, uh, conditions, my area of interest, submucous fibrosis, oral cancer, which should be everybody's area of interest. So you could study any of these techniques. So when it comes to molecular technique, the question you need to ask is what exactly is my clinical question? And then you decide whether they're going to study at the cellular level, at the DNA level, at the RNA level, at the protein or the metabolite level. Then you decide which of the technique you'll be discussed here today is going to be your tool of choice. And like I said, you could study microbiome using DNA-based approaches, RNA, protein, and metabolite. So these are fundamentally evolution of the basic molecular techniques that we have seen here today. Quickly, because this is my area of interest and my presentation wouldn't be complete. And I think all of us need to be interested in this because cancer is a major Indian problem. And uh, this can be true for any other disease. So any disease, you could substitute cancer with any disease. You can study the different types of genes. In the cancer, we study oncogenes, the suppressor genes, the apoptotic gene, the senescence genes, and the immunity genes. In addition to the genetic, uh, if you remember, I spoke about epigenetic, and this is a separate topic by itself. There are factors outside the genes which now influence how the genes function, and that is very important. You could use any of the technique, immunohistochemistry, polymerase chain reaction, qualitative or real-time PCR, Western blot for protein, spectroscopic analysis, like I said in ELISA. And spatial genomics and single genomics is nothing but harnessing the hybridization, sequencing, and the PCR at a very, very efficient level. I show you an example of that. Uh, this is actually an article which you can pick it up. Uh, it's called single cell genomics. So you take a single cell and then you can study the genomics, the, what is genomics and the transcriptomics, which is DNA to RNA from a single cell. You have techniques by which we can study multiple molecules which are going on and how exactly they are related to one another. Uh, this is just one review article and if you're interested, uh, this is my area of interest because I work on submucous fibrosis and this has got something to do with scar and mesenchymal cells and macrophages associated with scar tissue. Uh, so, so you can take a single cell and apply all these techniques uh, by means of these high throughput technologies and study the GNA, uh, sorry, sorry, the genomics and the transcriptomics, which is basically the genes, the DNA and the RNA, which has been transcribed from the DNA and ascertain the property of that particular cell and analyze it based on the clinical question that you're going to ask. Uh, okay, this is once again, quickly on about cancer. A cancer has got multiple processes involved, uh, blood circulation, the hypoxia, the immune cells, the stromal cells, and the cancer cells. Uh, we could localize each marker in the tissue. So if I feel there is something in the connective tissue which is driving the cancer, something in the epithelium, something in the blood vessel, and actually I can find out which cell and which particular gene is causing that particular problem. Uh, these are some exciting techniques. And one such technique is what is called the nanostring technology. So basically you use the concept of hybridization, which I mentioned earlier, but here we can actually barcode the gene. 
you can actually barcode the gene depending upon the combination of uh, molecules which are using to mark the gene. And just like you do a barcode in a in any of the shops which you go to, which you purchase, you have the series of lines. Uh, you just put an infrared scanner and it tells you exactly what substance you're looking at and what its prices and what its expiry date is and so on and so forth. You could link these sort of signaling molecules to the DNA, follows the same principle of hybridization, denaturation, and annealing. And then you could use multiple such barcoded genes and you could study in a cancer environment or any other disease which you're looking at in a tissue, which particular cell in that tissue is responsible, which particular gene is responsible, and where in the cell that gene is particularly located in the cytoplasm on the cell membrane. So there's been an explosion of these high throughput knowledges, uh, which makes it very convenient for us to find out exactly what is going, not only at the genetic level, but genetic level, at a particular type of tissue in the disease of interest. Obviously, a note, these are very, very expensive techniques which are not amenable to as a routine diagnostic tool, but are used for research purposes. But you need to understand that polymerase chain reaction was very expensive. And a decade, a couple of decades back, labs had to share a PCR machine. But today, it's so inexpensive that every lab has a polymerase chain reaction PCR machine with them. So these, te these technology, if they become validated in the future and uh, are you more widely used, the cost factor will definitely come down. But the point here to take home is that these techniques are available. And if you're interested in doing research at the cellular level, not just the tissue or the genome or the chromosome level, it's possible to do with collaborations and tying up with labs uh, if they have a like-minded interest in the clinical question that you are asking. Let me stop here and reiterate the fact that the clinical question decides your research question. The research question decides the variable. The variable or what you're going to measure decides the technique you're going to use, whether it's going to be at the tissue level, the cellular level, at the chromosome level, at the GNA level, at the DNA level, or the RNA level, which in turn decides what technique you're going to use depending upon the facility you have in your lab, the facility of your collaborators, and the amount of resource, the money which you have, which is highly critical. I haven't spoken about the cost of some of these techniques. And all the recent techniques, the genome-wide analysis, your multiplex PCRs, your nanostring technology, are based on the fundamental principle of karyotyping, uh, hybridization, blotting, RFLP, and DNA sequencing, ELISA, and immunohistochemistry, which I didn't touch upon because it's so commonly used now and there are multiple people talking on immunohistochemistry. So all these techniques are the backbone of the current advanced techniques. And if you understand the concept of these, it's easier to get a handle on how these high throughput modern technologies are being used. Uh, let me stop here. Uh, thank you for being very magnanimous by extending my time. Thank you very, very much. And uh, I'm open to any questions. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Ranganathan. It was a pleasure listening to you. And uh, uh, I'm so grateful that you have, uh, you know, carried forward the whole presentation in such a seamless and lucid fashion, uh, where you started with the very basic point of, you know, telling everybody to think uh, at very basic level at one question at a time instead of 10 with one technique and how to approach a problem. And it is the technique which is available that should not dictate your research question. It is the research question, and thereafter, what techniques are available, you plan accordingly. You so rightly said that if you have an exotic instrument, the aim should not be how to use it. It should be what is in your mind and what is the need of the uh, And uh, yeah. pleasure to listen to you. And the application. to hear in the beginning about the microbiome and the term about one health concept and we all know one moment you open your mouth it's full of microflora and so many of animals which are actually nobody thinks of nobody looks at them especially in our country leave aside the west and then of course you have talked about the utility of these various methods and the research questions which can be based on various inflammatory conditions various infectious diseases various cancerous pathologies, 
precancerous pathologies and non malignant conditions. Uh, I have uh, opened the point. There are some questions which have come in. Uh, if you would like to take on, and there's one question from uh, Dr. Prachi who has asked that uh, what are the best molecular techniques in salivary studies? Uh, sir, your inputs, because I think it's a very broad-based question, but still we would like to hear your points. Yeah, um, yes, I think uh, that was one of the articles which I actually kindly sent over. Um, I uh, it, It's difficult to put that in, but that's a very good question, salivary diagnostics. Uh, let me tell you what's going on now. Uh, the first the first concept I'd like to drive home is, and this is something which everybody takes for granted, when you take anything from the mouth, it's not saliva, it's whole mouth fluid. Uh, saliva involves uh, whatever you're taking from the mouth, it has gingival particular fluid, blood, so much other stuff. So you need to be very careful. So whole mouth fluid analysis is what is widely used. And if you need to study saliva, you need to take it directly from the parotid duct opening, the Stenson's duct, or the submandibular duct opening using a cretinous cannula or any one such um, uh, specialized technique. So let us get that out of the way. A whole mouth uh, fluid is what is studied. And that has become very important, uh, very sorry, very easy to do by what is called the concept of microfluidics, where small amount can be used. So microfluidics are a big thing in salivary diagnostics. Once again, it goes back to my question, what exactly you're interested in looking at whole mouth fluid? If you're looking at uh, factors associated with immunology like IgG and cytokines and inflammatory molecules, ELISA is the easiest way to go. Uh, if you're looking at microbiomes, you can do any of them, DNA or RNA. Um, of course, saliva, is, it's got so much stuff, um, which comes back to my original contention. We need to know what you're looking for in saliva. So if you were, if you could rephrase that and tell me uh, what is that substance you would like to look at, uh, you could, I could tell you what technique is currently being used. But these are two important concepts. The fact that you're using whole mouth fluid versus saliva. Two, microfluidics where small amounts can actually, uh, you know, sort of be sufficient to study whatever you're studying. Third, everything has been studied in saliva. Diabetes. Uh, you have Cancer molecule markers like P53, HPV, viruses, bacteria, uh, immunological markers, autoimmune markers, markers of metabolic health. Uh, you can look for Helicobacter pylori, which is the cause for gastric ulcer. Uh, once again, very, very versatile fluid. A uh, lot of work being going on, uh, like Dr. Sen rightly said. It's a very, very broad question. So ho hopefully I've shed some light on that. Thank you. So there are two more questions. I think they're related. Uh, one is the application of molecular techniques for potentially malignant disorders. That is from Dr. Abhay Kulkarni. And the similar question is molecular techniques for early detection of oral cancers. This is from Dr. Shipra Deshpande. So your Thanks both, Abhay and Shipra. Thank you very much. Uh, I know it it was very difficult for me not to put cancer slides early on. So I put it in the last, actually, because that's my one of my areas of interest. Answer is tremendously useful, uh, both in pre-cancer and cancer. And uh, the, the fact that is, I'm sure you're all aware, uh, we talk about dysplasia and leukoplakia. Uh, even now, we do not know which of these are high risk and low risk. Uh, put simply, which leukoplakias will become cancer and which won't become cancer. Uh, there is a lot of work in the molecular pathology going on in the pre-cancer, uh, what we call as potentially malignant lesion. The biggest thing of interest is what is called ploidy studies. And that's why I put that karyotyping and chromosome studies. Uh, we feel that ploidy analysis is a very, very versatile tool in helping us decide which leukoplakia is going to become cancer and which leukoplakia will not become cancer. When it is clubbed on to the routine histopathological diagnosis of mild, moderate, and severe dysplasia. And there is another technique which I didn't speak about, which is called LOH, what's called loss of heterozygosity. Basically, it's a technique is the same, but it looks for something called loss of heterozygosity. And if you remember the pedigree chart I put as autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, you had two alleles for a gene. And I said something called homozygous and heterozygous. So that loss of heterozygosity uh, is a very, very versatile tool. 
Um, there are a lot of other studies going on, but these two, ploidy and lot of loss of heterozygosity, are currently the most important tools in predicting which potentially malignant will become cancer or will not become cancer uh, at this point in time. Thank you for those questions. Thank you very much. Uh, one last question, uh, which is on the cost effectivity of these molecular techniques. Although you have said in the end, but uh, I guess the question is the application, is are we doing such a test? Yeah, Titi, um, once again, there are, there are two, three factors involved in cost. One, it depends on your institution, what amount of access you have and how much of work is going on. If it, let's, let's presume that you're an institution which is going to start PCR. It's going to be very, very expensive. And that's true for any technique. Let's say immunohistochemistry is very expensive. But if you are an institution or got a central research lab, which is already doing multiple works along with your medical university or other university, the cost comes down. Uh, my, my rule of thumb always has been is collaborate. Uh, unless you've got a huge grant in which you can develop your infrastructure. So when you begin something in your institution, the cost is going to be high. But as you start doing more cases, the cost is going to be less. If you collaborate, it's even going to be less. Uh, so yes, cost is a major factor in molecular techniques. The simpler techniques are definitely not expensive. Immunohistochemistry costs you know, a couple of thousands, very easy to do. ELISA costs a couple of thousands, very versatile tool, not very expensive. PCR, maybe a little bit more, a couple of lakhs. QPCR, maybe a little bit more. The other techniques, you definitely need a grant to get it up and running. And please do understand that it's not only the question of technique. It's a question of how strong your research question is. If your research question is very good, your sample size will be very less. If your research question is very bad, what is called, you know, you do what is called short done research, then your sample size is going to be huge and your cost is going to shoot up. So the cost factor involves a couple of different things. The technique itself, which is controllable, and you can actually ascertain what each of those techniques cause for one particular clinical sample, but also the design of your study. How much samples are you going to be doing and how fast you're going to be doing? So in that respect, the last tool which I mentioned, ELISA, is very versatile because you can run 90 clinical samples at one shot. And immunohistochemistry you can run multiple, like you have automated immunohistochemical setups nowadays. So it's a very tricky question to answer, but hopefully I've given an idea why it is tricky. What is the reason behind the complexity of the cost factor? Thank you. One last question, sir. Uh, uh, and there's a question which says, is there any molecular technique or techniques uh, which can predict recurrence of amyloblastoma? So I wonder if it's a, it's a research question or has it been already researched on? Okay. Uh, all right. There, there, there are two aspects of this question. And... Uh, uh, let me first talk about the amyloblastoma component. Um, this one thing which you need to remember, which we talk in immunohistochemistry, okay, which is widely used too. There is no antibody which can tell you whether a tumor is benign or malignant. It's impossible. Uh, there is, we do not have any particular marker to tell you something is malignant. You need to study it at a cellular or tissue level. First point. So an amyloblastoma has to be studied at, you know, uh, at the tissue level to do its amyloblastoma. Of course, you are, I'm sure you're aware of BRAF-V600E. Uh, that's, that's a molecule which has been studied in amyloblastoma. The BRAF-V600E mutation is not present in all amyloblastomas. That's one. Second, there's another thing called SMO2, uh, SMO2, which has also been studied in amyloblastoma. And these have been associated with the prognosis as far as recurrence and behavior of amyloblastoma. But the problem with that is all amyloblastomas don't expect these markers. So when they are expressed, you're good. Then coming back to the question of recurrent amyloblastoma, we know there are clinical factors which are actually more predictive of recurrent amyloblastomas. One, clear margins. Two, sight. Maxillary lesions tend to occur more often than mandibular lesions. And once again, this is because, you know, uh, the nature of maxilla in which you can't get a clear margin. And three, diagnosing it correctly. Because I know a lot of times uh, we have done that in the past when unicystic amyloblastoma was not something we recognized. If you have a lot of unicystic amyloblastomas, your surgery will have excellent, uh, what should I say, record of no recurrent amyloblastomas. Uh, so when you start separating them out, uh, it's difficult. So 
practically speaking, what I have worked with is the size of the ameloblastoma, the margins following the surgical procedure, the location are more indicative. I just saw a paper a couple of weeks back, which is going to be presented in a radiology conference in Delhi. Uh, it just came to me for review, where they claim that there are certain radiographic features that can actually predict whether an ameloblastoma can be recurrent or not. Uh, but I, that's not published. Uh, if it gets published, that may be another factor which you may need to take into consideration uh, for recurrence. So at this point in time, other than BRAFV600E, and maybe in some cases SMO2, I don't think uh, there is any particular marker I can think of. So I think we'll stop here. I mean, we have taken a lot of your time, but believe me, sir, it has been a pleasure. And I thank to begin with, uh, of course, you and thereafter. This was the genesis, I must tell you, was one of the pre PhD workshops where a lot of our dental colleagues who had come had posed this question to us. And we thought that why not? And that's when I contacted Professor Logani of the Institute uh, in Delhi wherein he connected me to you. So thank you to all of you and all the faculty and participants. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I'll stop the session for the day here and uh, request all to know. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you.